Hi there. Um, my name's uh, Nish Srikandaraja. Um, I'm a neurosurgical um, resident or a senior trainee in the Liverpool, uh, uh, United Kingdom. Um, and uh, I would like to talk to you today about outcomes in Cordoquina syndrome, um, which was essentially what I did um, uh, for my PhD at the University of Liverpool. Um, so if I go into it, I'm, I'm going to talk about Cordoquina syndrome, um, even though it's probably been mentioned a few times and you probably already know um, a lot about it. I'll try and, um, in simple terms, describe what I understand about it. Um, and then I want to uh, talk about the, the concept of a core outcome set, um, which we've, uh, through an international consensus, a consensus process we've developed a quarter quina core outcome set syndrome core outcome set so i'll go through this um so what is quarter quina syndrome it's a it's a serious neurological condition which generally affects young working age adults um and it's due to in most cases a compression in what we call the quarter quina nerve roots and these are essentially nerve roots. That in Latin, it means horse's tail. So these are nerve roots that come off the end of the spinal cord. And in most cases, due to compression, such as a, a herniated disc, um, it, it, uh, it, it uh, causes dysfunction of these nerve roots. And that can lead to significant morbidity and disability for young working age adults. So it's a significant effect um, for these patients and also uh, for their families as well. Um, and there can be a number of uh, issues that it causes because these nerve roots um, supply uh, leg power. They also uh, uh, supply um, uh, 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 nerve root uh, power for your uh, bladder and your bowels to function as well, in, including sexual uh, function. Um, so it can have wide-ranging effects um, and there is a scale which I'll talk about later and inevitably it's associated with a, um, quite a high medico legal burden but I think that's more of a reflection of um, how much of an impression this condition makes on, on, on patients. So if we go on to looking at the definition for Corda Aquinas syndrome it's really varied um, out there in literature. You would think something as serious as this condition has a clear cut definition, but if, if, you, if we look at this um, review article done by Fraser back in 2009, there was over 17 different definitions um, in, the, in the scientific literature for this condition. But they said the three most common themes it should include, which they recommended, the definition should include bladder and bowel, dysfunction, reduce sensation in the saddle area, that's the area downstairs, and sexual dysfunction with uh, possible, they say, neurological deficit in the lower limbs means weakness in your legs, essentially. So they felt it should include these um, uh, uh, facets. Now, the most used currently at the moment, the most used definition is uh, one that was developed by Gleaves and McFarland, who are two British neurosurgeons many years ago. And this, this kind of encompasses the spectrum of Cordoquina syndrome. So you can, uh, it's over here, um, one of the tables I used in my papers. It's Cordoquina syndrome incomplete, so CESI, and Cordoquina syndrome with urinary retention, that's CESR, which essentially is Cordoquina complete. So if I describe the most serious one, so essentially CESR, quadriquina syndrome with urinary retention, is low back pain, leg pain, and also this is the, the, the key one, it, it is painless urinary retention, which means your bladder fills up and you can't, you can't feel it filling up, and then it, it has overflow incontinence, whereby it overflows. So you wet yourself and, and you don't realize it. So that's kind of at the end stage. In addition to that, you get complete perianal sensory loss. So essentially, when you're wiping downstairs around your genital area or your anal area, you don't, you don't feel anything. So that's the most severe form of cordoquina syndrome. And the outcomes inevitably are worse 
with that sort of a, a, a condition. And the one in between is called Cordoquana syndrome incomplete, and that is low back pain, leg pain. It could be unilateral or bilateral on both sides. But this is kind of a halfway house. So you can have problems with your bladder, which can range from you know losing the sense the desire to go to the toilet altered so when you're passing urine you have a different sensation and hesitancy when you're passing it so and also the numbness downstairs that what we call saddle anesthesia or saddle numbness that could be down one side so it could be partial um so this is what we call incomplete and there's more of a chance of things improving if you're in this area. The other area, which people tend to call CESS, which is suspected Cordoquana syndrome, or CESE, which is early Cordoquana syndrome, is if you're thinking low back pain and bilateral leg pain. So leg pain down both sides. That's, you're starting, it's not a definition of Cordoquana syndrome 100%, but it's, you're starting to think that you know a patient is evolving towards this condition okay and then there are standards of care that we tend to follow as um, as medical professionals and in the uk there's guidelines from the british british association of spine surgeons and also the society of british neurological surgeons and essentially they, it all boils down to quite a similar uh, message their message is if you detect or you're, or you're or suspecting Cordoquana syndrome, get an MRI scan or relevant imaging. And then if the imaging shows you that there's a compression, get the operation done as soon as possible, if possible. So that, that's the uh, um, essential uh, message. And I'm sure there's uh, the relevant uh, standards of care in the US as well uh, for this condition. But the main thing about quadroquina syndrome is, um, especially when it's caused by compression, which is in most cases like a herniated disc, the key to this diagnosis of this condition, it's a clinical and radiological condition. So just because you have the clinical symptoms, such as low back pain, leg pain, urinary or bowel issues, doesn't mean you have quadroquina syndrome per se. You have to have the radiological findings as well. So that's why an MRI is really key. And I believe the CES Foundation use this. They have this on their website, which is really useful. And a stat MRI means you need to get an MRI immediately. But I also um, uh, made uh, uh, comments for uh, the BBC, which was published in one of their articles. Um, and I said to them um, that essentially I think that here is the, the issue that we are finding it very difficult to get, especially in the UK, to get an MRI uh, immediately because uh, MRI services aren't available 24 hours in every hospital. It's only available out of hours in tertiary centres in the UK. Um, and as you know, in a tertiary centre, the resources are quite limited because you're treating neurological injuries for 37 or 40 hospitals so you're having to prioritize so hence you might get a delay in scans and that's the problem so i think that the issue is also a structural issue an infrastructure issue where we have to make sure that an mri scan is available like like a ct scan is you can get a ct scan anywhere immediately um, and if if things such as a quadroquina syndrome is diagnosed um, quicker with an MRI scan, then inevitably the operation or the treatment for it should just follow. So I think that's that's the that's the biting point there. And the operation, um, I'll go through quickly. I'm not putting these pictures up for vanity. This is because I had to take these pictures for um, to support my research funding from the Royal College. But I'm putting it here as an example because just to show that you can do the operation for Cordoquana syndrome many different ways, okay? So you, you're going at the back of a patient's spine, at the lower end of their spine. So if you, this is the vertebra, I hope you can see my arrow, but this is the vertebra. And at the back, you have the lamina. So these are the, um, uh, these are the uh, knobbly bits you can feel at the back of your spine. We call them the spinous process. And essentially, the operation can be done different ways. So you can take off this whole lamina and spinous process. That's called a laminectomy. You can go down one side to get to the disc. 
if you have the spinal cord here and the disc bulging out on the side, you can get to it through a micro discectomy, or you can get to it by knocking off the spinous process, preserving that and taking off the lamina. So a spinous process osteotomy and, and taking off the uh, and doing a laminectomy. There's different ways to do it, but essentially the, the goal is to remove that disc. And here you can see how big some of the pieces can be that are impinging on your cordo equina roots to, to free it up. Okay, so that's the aim of the operation is to remove that compression. Um, and ideally, the, the current literature out there suggests that ideally it should be done within 24 to 48 hours of when you get the uh, symptoms of bowel or bladder dysfunction. That's when the, the clock starts ticking, essentially. So <clears throat> there's heavy litigation um, for this condition. And that's unsurprising, in my view, because... It causes such a burden to patients uh, when they suffer disability from it. That, that That's what it's a reflection of, um, I believe. Um, and the way uh, to make this all better is to not, you know, it's not necessarily just improving communication. It's it's improving the whole thing, you know, the, the management, the acute management and the chronic management of this condition. So our initial work was back in um, 2015 um, and what we did is that for this condition we thought, look, we felt bladder outcome was really important uh, for patients and we said, oh, how much, you know, does an early decompression make a difference for this condition and how early should you decompress? And we found, you know, the categories I was talking about earlier. So we found that if you decompress less than 24 hours for patients who are in that incomplete stage of cordo equina in the middle, which is most patients actually, that there is a five times better chance of their bladder outcome being better than if you decompress the spot the cordo equina nerve roots after 48 hours. Okay, so that's that. That was a, a retrospective study we, we did on 200 patients. So that although that was an interesting finding, it wasn't going to change management because the level of evidence is still um, level three. You, you need better level evidence. So I went to look at the research which is out there for Cordoquina syndrome. And what you find is it's really heterogeneous. It's, it's all over the place. So what you find is some some group in the US, for example, will say, well, we'll look at we'll look at bladder and bowel outcome. And another group will say, well, we'll look at back pain and leg pain and bladder. And then another group in Europe will say, well, we'll look at sexual function and bowel and bladder function, but not anything else. So what you, you're finding is people are looking at different things. And then how do you combine the results? You, you basically, you've got apples and pears. So you can't combine apples and pears and analyze them. Um, and that's what's happening with research. And this happens in many conditions. But this, this was obvious when I was looking at cordo equina syndrome. And therein lies the solution. Um, the solution I felt was, you know, we felt in Liverpool was developing a core outcome set for cordo equina syndrome. And this would identify um, what the minimum outcomes should be, which is included in any study or trial for a healthcare condition. And it hi highlights the outcomes that are actually matter most to key stakeholders, such as patients and healthcare professionals, by taking them through this consensus process. Um, and in inevitably, over time, if everybody is looking at the same outcomes, thereby uh, apples and apples, for example, then you can compare them uh, over a long period of time and be make better meta-analysis uh, and better informed healthcare uh, decisions. Has it been done before? Yes, it's been done in rheumatology, uh, which is a speciality that looks after joints and arthritis. They started this over 20 years ago and their 
their evidence base is so much better because of it, and they have better healthcare uh, uh, recommendations and decisions uh, now after doing that. But it's taken a long time, and the similar thing is happening for women's health as well. So we felt it's you know, Cordoquana syndrome uh, deserves this kind of a, uh, um, a baseline remodeling of its research. And it's supported by major funding bodies, um, such as the National Institute for Health Research and the World Health Organization. They realized that this is the way to go now. Um, so we decided to do this. We registered it on the Comet Initiative, which is the core outcome measures and effectiveness trials. It's just a database where, which holds all these core outcome sets for different disease processes. And then we published our protocol in BMJ so that it's a transparent process. Um, and we went through the stages of doing a literature review to find out what's there already in the literature for the outcomes of Cordoquina. Then we went on to qualitative patient interviews. So we interviewed patients one to one um, to find out what outcomes mattered to them. Uh, then we put all of these outcomes through a, a, a consensus process called a Delphi, which I'll explain later on. And we had a consensus meeting. So if we go to the systematic literature review, which we published in uh, Spine Journal, um, what we found, and, uh, and this was in 2018, what we found is if you look at all the, this is a stacked bar chart from the paper, which, is, which you can access, the, all the outcomes are on the y-axis. But if you look at the red, the red means the definition was not present for these outcomes. And if you look at the orange, it means that a, an appropriate assessment was not there for these outcomes. So for a lot of these outcomes, there's you can look at you can see that most of it's red and orange. There's no uh, decent definition. Uh, there's no definition at all, actually, and there's no uh, uh, proper assessment uh, tool being used for these outcomes, um, which is quite significant. So this is the the, the body of evidence you've got there for Cordoquina syndrome. It's it's quite poor. So now we've defined all those outcomes in the literature. This is what healthcare professionals think are important. We then went on to discuss this with uh, and talk to patients about how their outcomes were. And we had a range of patients, patients who were Cordoquina CSR complete or CSI incomplete, um, and also short duration, less than two years from their operation or patients who've had it for a long time, say coming up to 10 years. So we had a range of patients and it was all uh, approved by ethics. And some really interesting insights came out of uh, these patient interviews. So, you know, these are some of the themes we're, we're currently writing this up, but there were varying priorities of their health. So different things meant uh, were important to different patients. So patients early on in this condition, just after the operation, they were really concerned of their bladder and bowel function and their sexual function. Uh, that was evident. But as time went on, sometimes patients who were really badly affected from bladder and bowel learnt to manage their conditions with that. But the things which really affected them were the, were the was things such as mobility, um, the back and leg pain and postural difficulties, these are the kind of things. So it was varying at different time points of their, uh, of their uh, journey. The second thing was a fragmented healthcare service. So, you know, there was real anger and discontent over the delay in management, the problems with follow up. It's not a holistic care that they receive. It's very fragmented. Um, and also the third theme was the process of adjustment. So you find that for um, a lot of patients, things happen quite quickly. So it's an acute process. It's almost like revolving doors. You, you, your whole situation, your life situation changes um, and you suddenly are in severe uh, lower back and leg pain and, you, and your bowel and your bladder uh, is not working and you have numbness and then you go into hospital you have an operation and as soon as the operation's done you're out of the door so it's quite an acute process and um, one patient described it really well and she said it's almost it's like a post-traumatic stress um, uh, episode because you go in things change so acutely um, and then afterwards you're kind of left to manage it there's no proper structure in place you know, in terms of returning to work, recovery. 
And then the fourth theme is the anticipatory anxiety and the diminished self-worth. So over time, the anxiety develops, the isolation, the low mood. Some patients were, were you know, had episodes of suicidal thoughts or even trying to commit suicide uh, and reasoning and awareness. And this is, this is really the quality of life, the um, um, indicators that are not really looked at in the literature. Um, and also the main thing that came out of this was the long-term management is just really isn't there. Uh, and there's very few sort of papers that describe this one-to-one -one speaking with patients. And I think that's that's what also needs to develop. There needs to be a holistic um, service offering um, long-term management to, for all the you know different facets you have which can which uh, go wrong in this condition. So as I've described, what we have is we have the outcomes we've got from the uh, quality, uh, the, the systematic literature review for what healthcare professionals think are important. Then we have the interviews with patients and the outcomes which they think are important. And then you put that long list and you make it into a short list with, with your study group. And we had patient representatives who helped us achieve this. And you come up with a Delphi list. So what you have in the Delphi list, these are the outcomes which we were going to prioritise and find out which were the most important for key stakeholders. And um, what a Delphi is essentially is, if I take the example of, say, uh, incontinence of urine, you put that forward for your first Delphi round, which is like a questionnaire, and it's based on the light, and then you as a patient rate that incontinence of urine of how important you think that is to be studied in future research studies and for yourself on a Likert scale of one to nine, nine being critical and one being not that important. So if you rate it as eight, and then when the second round comes, you get your anonymous feedback of all the results from all the other patients and healthcare professionals, and you find that everybody else on average rated it eight equally as important. So you think, yeah, I'm gonna stick with my decision that this is critically important. Say, for example, you then look at low mood and depression and you didn't think it was that important as a doctor for these for cordoquina syndrome and you rated it a one or a two. And then on the anonymous feedback, it's rated as a, a nine by everybody else, especially patients. What you might say is, oh, actually, on my on on reviewing this on the second round of the Delphi, I'm going to click that it's an eight that it's important. So by doing this for all these outcomes, you you converge on a consensus, um, and it was a great it was it, it was a lifeline having um, charity organisations like the Cordo Quina Foundation in the US involved and Cordo Quina Champions Charity in the in the UK because they brought in all the patients. So we had uh, that. That was a great help, um, and also we had loads of healthcare professional bodies from across the world. And for such a rare condition, um, we had uh, 172 participants uh, in this Delphi study, uh, which is really good. And in green, you can see at the end of um, this uh, Delphi consensus process, these are the outcomes which. Um, healthcare professionals and patients felt were the most important and the ones in red were um, uh, rejected and the ones which don't have any colour, well, they had to go on to a consensus meeting. So we held an international consensus meeting, which the Cordo Quina Foundation helped us with the funding for as well. And we got funding from industry and other charity bodies. And it was international. We had 34 delegates, nine from uh, uh, different countries and 25 from the UK. And it was, it was a really, it was a great day bringing everybody together so they can discuss all the outcomes which didn't have a, a decision on them. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, not everybody is going to be 100% happy, but you have to be happy with the process and agree on it. Um, and so three more outcomes were included after a, a day of discussion into this core outcome set. So as an overview, as I said, it's a it's a transparent process. We went through a systematic literature review to identify what the outcomes were that were important for healthcare professionals in the literature already. We did qualitative interviews with patients one to one to identify what outcomes were important to them. We've combined them and made it into a short list for this Delphi process, which then prioritized it and then took it to a consensus meeting. And then we have the 16 outcomes which constitute 
the called Aquinas Syndrome Core Outcome Sets. Um, so this is published as an open access journal uh, article which you can uh, access uh, and read uh, in more details, uh, which I didn't go into. To go through these outcomes, which we have deemed the most important for future research. So I go through them. Bladder function, we want all studies in the future to look at incontinence of urine, um, uh, essentially wetting yourself, urinary retention, so holding your bladder, holding on to the urine and not letting it, um, uh, uh, not voiding. Sensation of bladder fullness, yeah, if you can feel your bladder filling up. In terms of bowel function, fecal incontinence. Um, uh, and then in terms of sexual function, the physical ability to have sexual intercourse uh, was deemed critical to investigate. In terms of sensation, perineal sensation or sensation in genitals, what people commonly refer to as saddle numbness. Um, and then leg muscle strength was deemed critical as well. Pain due to abnormal sensation or non-painful stimulus. So medically we would call that allodynia. It's a type of dysesthetic dis neuro, it's a nerve-related neuropathic pain. Complications, anything including death is important, but this is the big one. The quality of life is the one which is not really put out there in the literature. Um, and that was um, uh, placed into its different subsets because uh, not all quality of life um, questionnaires or assessments include all of the indicators. So global quality of life is important, the overall assessment. Occupational role functioning, which is essentially your ability to go back to work. Social functioning is the ability to uh, mix with um, family and friends and interact with society. Ability to do daily activities, mobility and walking, and low mood and depression. So these 16 outcomes are deemed critical for any future quarter Aquinas syndrome studies to, st uh, to look at. So currently at the moment, we have a multi-center study happening in, 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 the, in the UK um, and I'm part of the study committee for this. And at the moment, we've got just over about 350 patients, which we've collected data on. And uh, we are planning to use this core outcome set that we've developed for Cordoquana syndrome to look up the following follow-up data. So it addresses all of these outcomes. And we're at the data analysis stage. So it's, it'll be really interesting to see the outcome of this and what it shows. So in conclusion, we've gone through a transparent uh, international consensus process, which has been agreed between patients and healthcare professionals who are the key stakeholders. And hopefully uh, the idea is now we've developed what outcomes are important. The next stage which we're looking at is to identify how best um, to measure, to assess these outcomes. So if you think about it, if you if you know which outcomes are the most important and how best to assess them, then essentially you can run a, a very good study. And the idea is if we can do multiple studies like this, we can uh, amass all of this data together to make better management plans for this condition. Now, um, I got to say thanks to uh, the charity organisations, uh, Cordo Quina Foundation and the Cordo Quina Champions Charity, for their immense help uh, uh, in this research project, and all the patients and healthcare pro professionals who really gave up their time to make this piece of research uh, uh, work, um, and also my supervisors as well. And uh, this is just the beginning. Um, we're definitely planning uh, to look further into this condition um, in Liverpool. Uh, we're planning to dedicate a lot of the, a lot of our time in the future in terms of our research to looking into this. And I know other institutions are as well. Uh, so I think this is uh, this is just the beginning. Um, uh, and um, I'm not sure if I'll be uh, allowed to answer any questions, but um, if there's any questions, uh, please feel free. Uh, thank you very much.